That, that was actually contained in the brief. The, 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 the expected marketing, uh, the expected um, purchases of that. And I can't remember the... 70% 70%. would be uh, of Asian, and 70% of those would be in Sydney, and 70% of those would be owner occupiers, and I think 70% of those would be <laughs> investment. There was, there was some... Very, Some seven percent very everywhere. complex, yeah. um, uh, well, very simple. So I suppose the question then becomes about how does that fit within Sydney as, as a city? Is, is that the right fit? Does the building match the demand, I suppose? Uh, you'd have to answer. <laughs> I guess um, China, um, Greenland would answer that, but based on sales, I think they seem to have got it right. And from our point of view, the building's smack in the middle of Chinatown, or pretty much. Right. So. Uh, it's part of what's going on in town, or going on in the world. Um, so we so feel that was a pretty consistent... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I beg your pardon? Do we kind of see this a little bit as, as kind of China building for the Chinese? Or, Sorry? You know, China building for the Chinese. Oh, um, what, what, why is this right for Sydney? Well, you know, understand that there is a massive Asian population here, yeah, that's, that's understood. But there's more to Sydney than that Asian population. It's going to be something that's shared, that's culturally diverse. Uh, we have, we have anyone can buy the apartments. I think anyone can buy the apartments. I, I mean, yeah. you, you might know better actually what the proportion was. But well, well, I think that it has been... Well, again, I'm talking about the Sydney balcony. We were... There was a market that was identified, but that market was um, coming to Sydney, so we wanted to explain what was good about Sydney. Yeah. And, and that's... And for us, it was a, an opportunity not just in Sydney, but for the world, for people to say, well, can you use these balconies? It just happens that Australia, Sydney's got a great climate or Australia's got a great climate, and Australians probably aren't used to being up 70 floors and not being able to go outside. So that was something that we were trying to do. As for marketing, it is interesting that, that, that we know so far <coughs> um, that obviously there's been a lot of Chinese uh, mainland Chinese buy it, but there's been a lot of Australians of Chinese heritage buy the building, buy in the building, and we're actually working on one now where they've bought three apartments, people moving from Darling Point to to here in their retirement. So, so th th those people have been in Australia for 25 years, as long, far as I know. Addressing that question, yes, isn't it? I know what your answer is. I think uh, so. The question is what the top of the um, what the top of a residential tower should be used for. Should it be communal or should it be private? I think, Kev, we've seen your approach, which was uh, quite different. I think, and, uh, so perhaps you well, can stop. perhaps we should define communal. Um, if you want to stick to the brief, you wouldn't say it's public, but for us, it was absolutely communal. Uh, personally, we would very much believe it ought to be public, but that's a tricky thing to pull off in a residential building. In Crown Casino, different story, um, something like that. I think we're obliged to provide public space at the height that these buildings reach. Maybe some of the other speakers have an opinion. Well, we, we've had a similar experience with a building in Melbourne, which is about 300 metres. and just been launched and the view from the agents was we originally had communal facilities at the top. Um, they create a real pressure on lifting. You've got to, get, to have a public public space at the top of a building, you're basically running lifts all the way through. So it's just a gigantic hit to the bottom line. So the developers don't particularly like it, even as much as we like it. And then the idea of putting communal communal residence facilities at the top, that gets axed by the agents because the agents go, well, if I just made that a whole floor apartment, I could sell it for any number I can think of, basically. <laughs> Sorry, just repeating the question. The question relates to structure and the retention of the existing structure and the value of retaining the existing structure from a project perspective. What would you have done if you didn't have to do that? 
or should we get all your structural engineering consultants up to, to share the thinking? Uh, I'm happy to say that it was very clearly pointed out in the project brief that speed of construction was an absolute key driver of this project and retaining, I, I understand that Greenland, I mean, we all know that this building has been owned by quite a few owners um, who've had a crack at, at uh, making the site stack up. My understanding is that retaining the existing building, um, putting the exoskeleton up, doing the most massive alts and adds that anyone has ever dreamt of was the fastest thing to bring these, these apartments to, to market. And that's what was the key driver. Um, so we didn't challenge that. Um, and I guess we haven't thought about what we'd do without it. Um, it was a nice bone to chew on. Um, it gave us plenty to worry about. Um, so yeah, sorry, we haven't thought about what we'd do without it. Drew, another committee member has something to say. Following up what you just said, Ken, um, speed, you want to imagine think in modern day terms, modular construction. Uh, was that considered in any of your schemes? Modular construction, bringing in whole parts of the building and slotting them in place, making them offsite, rather like the China experience? Yeah, we certainly, um, we certainly explored that, and uh, you know, it was, it's, it's debatable um, w whether it will save you time. And, and uh, you know, there's a whole lot of you know, parts of manufacture that have to be worked through, and in a competition process, that's um, you know, not really possible. But I certainly think that there is scope there, and we're seeing <coughs> that a lot in residential projects. We're doing it in student housing. Um, we're now looking at it, we're doing it in bathroom modules. Um, it's certainly coming to Australia. Um, and, you know, we, we suffer from the problem of distance, uh, you know, dispersed market, um, where, do you, where do you make it, how do you get it there? That's the issue here. Uh, but it is starting to, to bite, I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, we did consider it as well. I mean, our firm has done a lot of research into modular construction <laughs> and one of our directors has got an entire separate business around that. but. I think in the end we were nervous about hanging our hat on something that might just be an instant no-go. And I suppose we wanted to keep it as flexible and conventional as possible. I suppose it's one of those things about how much you stick within the rules and how much you, you go outside the rules. Yeah, I'd like to add to that uh, exactly the same issue. Um, that's the downside of competitions. We don't get to talk to the client. Um, for example, the, um, mo the automated car parking, we were told we had to absolutely provide an alternative option. Um, we were very keen in answering the question. We were very keen to look at uh, prefabricated timber because it's lightweight. You could drop it on fast. It would have minimum impact on the structure below, therefore reducing the um, exoskeleton, the cost. But we made an uh, executive decision at the beginning of the competition. You don't get to talk to the client. We, don't th we therefore don't present provocative things. We went out on a limb enough with cladding the entire thing in glass. Um, so that's as far as we dared go. Um, I, I, I probably concur with most of those things. The only the thing that we did do, though, was um, things like bathrooms and kitchens. We looked at having a, a similar base through the whole building. So the bathrooms, I think, except for the penthouses, there are only two or three different sizes. Um, and there is, as we know, a place on the central coast that does pretty fantastic um, prefabricated bathrooms and things. As far as, so, so, we, so that's where we limited it to. When you're working within the first 26 floors of the existing building, I think it would be very hard to do anything else in that, in that zone. And as, as far as I understand, Ray might know a little bit more, but the total modular construction has a height limit at the moment that it can get to, and this building was beyond that to start with. Well, one more question.
question is primarily around wind mitigation and how you've addressed that with respect to the, the local climatic conditions. Um, well, we've had, um, we're going through a parallel process on a couple of projects um, where we've got a couple of, we've got two hundred storey plus towers in our office at the moment. And one of them is in Melbourne and it's been through a couple of iterations. And the latest iteration of that tower has gone to a very curved form. And the interesting thing that we found was the previous iteration had quite significant issues with wind um, when it was more rectilinear. Um, not only pedestrian comfort, but lateral stability, it, it, it was struggling. Um, the current iteration, and it kind of backed up our approach in the, in the competition, which is to go for a more curvilinear tower form. The current iteration has almost zero requirement for pedestrian wind mitigation. And we almost think we could get rid of all dampening in terms of lateral structural stability as well for a 300 meter tower, which is, it's an, it's, it was an amazing um, experience for us to realize how much just simple design decisions like that make on the overall structure of the building. So. Could I just say stay tuned because uh, we're moving, the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat is moving through the design excellence thing, but technical issues are definitely on our agenda and wind is one of the major ones. That's an interesting one. Um, what, what's actually happened with the Sydney balcony was that there's a, there's a rule that says 25% um, openable area and, an, and wall above at a certain point. And there was general support from the council that originally, after the competition, the scheme that we put into the competition they didn't believe was going to satisfy that code or that that requirement and so we worked we had um, a, we there was a very quick process after the competition was won we had seven weeks to do the DA and integrate a lot of design changes so we had um, a lot of meetings with council about how this space could not be converted to a, a room after and how what we were trying to do was could happen. And so basically the 25% the, the was calculated by a, the slant of the, the new glass, which wasn't in the drawing, I'm sorry, um, a louver at the bottom, which is 450 above the ground, and then it being open at the top. And they're actually, I mean, another way is just say they're windshields and, they're, and there's um, gaps between the glass. So, I mean, a lot of buildings like Bly Street has a big windshield around the top of it. And so it, it's essentially come down to that. But then legally speaking, in the end, even though they fully support it and said that it's not going to be able to be converted to a room later and, nobody, and, it, and it does all the things, they, legally they thought that it didn't comply with it. And so they, and I'm not, not totally up on this thing, they made, they made some changes so that we were able to count it as that. But the main thing was that it wasn't, it wasn't now or ever be able to be changed into a space, uh, an internal space. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to call it at that for, for question time. Um, I'm sure the uh, panellists and speakers would be more than happy to field your questions privately <coughs> afterwards. Um, so please feel free to take some time, have a glass of wine, network. And just thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you for your insightful questions. And we hope to welcome you to the next event as and when we've got it organised. So again, thank you to Hassel, thank you to our sponsors, and most of all, our speakers for sharing their wonderful design ideas about this fabulous project.